Davis, and I'm very happy to be here uh, at Ruins DC. This is the third time uh, we've been here. Uh, and this is an amazing conference. I mean, I get like chills walking through the vending complex and looking at the book and seeing all the different types of talks. And I'm most excited by so many people of color that are leading organizations and leading thought sessions at Rooting DC. I mean, you guys should be really proud. Uh, I serve as community engagement manager at Lewis Ginner Botanical Garden. Uh, today, um, I can't remember what I told him I was going to talk about, but uh, <laughs> we're going to uh, talk about transforming the built environment uh, through a lens of racial equity. Uh, probably a lot about urban greening. Uh, we'll talk about building community capacity. Um, and I hope uh, to cover a couple steps of how to engage this work through a racial equity lens. And then um, if I land this properly with just the right amount of time, you know, maybe I can give you some insights on how to get some money to do the work. I mean, that's be hopeful, right? You know, we'll be so optimistic. <laughs> um, so, uh, Again, uh, I serve as a uh, uh, community engagement manager at this place, Lewis Ginner Botanical Garden, but my story does not start there. I am a, I've been an activist uh, advocate uh, since I was 21 years old. I'm 39, so all of my adult life, I've been engaging in conversations and work around cultural identity for people of African ancestry, holistic health and wellness, poverty, food policy, and most uh, concurrently, urban agriculture. So um, ever since I can drink alcohol, I've been digging into this work in some way, shape, form, or fashion, and just being fluid. But um, right now, I get to work at one of the whitest places in the city of Richmond. Um, Lewis Gunner Botanical Garden. It's a 50-acre botanical garden. Um, very monochromatic in leadership and attendance, much like many other botanical gardens all across the country. I just went, uh, was it Thursday? We were at the uh, National Arboretum, U.S. National Arboretum, and um, amazing dialogue with uh, staff there as they wrestle with how do they become more inclusive in their attendance, leadership, programming, and et cetera. So maybe that's a jewel or a tip that there's collaborations waiting to happen uh, at the National Arboretum and as well as the uh, U.S. Botanical Garden. But anyway, uh, Lewis Ginner is like 30 years old, uh, 36 years old. Uh, it was founded by a guy, uh, it was founded by um, a group of Garden Club of Virginia people, but the guy's name, Lewis Ginter. Lewis Ginter is a, uh, uh, a mogul from the 1800s. Uh, he was a Confederate major. Um, he was a businessman. He made his money off of cigarettes, right? So, you know, I mean, come on, we're in Richmond, Virginia, tobacco, right? So back in the day when cigarettes got sold, they sold them by, you know, the single, or you could buy two or three cigarettes at a time. And they wrap it in a piece of paper, and that was the transaction. Well, the guy, Lewis Ginner, comes up with the idea of putting a piece of cardboard with illustrations on it, and hence becomes the pack of cigarettes, right? Makes millions of dollars. Of course, you know, he didn't pay the blacks any money to, you know, grow and harvest the tobacco. Uh, but he made millions of dollars development of different parts of town. Uh, there's a really famous hotel in Richmond called the Jefferson. It's like one of the landmarks of the city. So famous. Um, he was so rich that not only did he build the Jefferson Hotel, but he owned the brick company that made the Jefferson <laughs> So, you know, this is to give you an idea of how oligarchy works. Um, Lewis Ginner Botanical Art, Lewis Ginner passes his wealth on to his, his niece, a woman named Grace Arndt, who, who uh, is a businesswoman in her own right. She's also a social philanthropist. She suffragists and puts money into different parts of town that create uh, kindergartens, uh, libraries, put plumbing in, in different neighborhoods or whatever. So fast forward, uh, 1984. Uh, Garden Clubs of Virginia, they're pretty white organizations too. You know, all across the country, Garden Clubs are predominantly white institutions. There's a whole conversation about how the Garden Clubs, these really white women-led organizations, really 
founded a bunch of these botanical gardens all across the country and how they excluded people of color, women of color specifically, right? Um, but that's a whole nother lecture. Um, but they came together, they said, hey, you know, Grace Arms left this money to create Lewis Ginner Botanical Garden, to create a botanical garden on the property that she used to live and work. And she also dropped, uh, uh, left the land, the physical land, to the city of Richmond, right? So her aspiration was that, you know, you're gonna use this money, but you're gonna use this money for it to be a botanical garden. Uh, uh, today, 400, over 450,000 annual visitors, uh, 7.2 million dollars a year, 12 themed gardens, very beautiful place. Uh, but it lives in this world of all of these botanical institutions uh, across the continental U.S. wrestling with the idea, or wrestling with the reality, I should say, that they have inherited a legacy of exclusivity. All right, very wealthy spaces, very white spaces, uh, spaces that even though they may not intend to do it today because of their legacy of how they were founded and who were the people that were attracted to that space as a result of their founding, people of color are pretty much not there or have not been coming there. So Lewis Ginner has been doing this introspection and um, in 2016 uh, I was hired as the uh, community engagement coordinator to help the garden expand beyond its walls. Uh, the work that I get to do is multifaceted, um, but I'll get into that in a second. But Richmond, Virginia. Uh, Richmond, Virginia is the former capital of the Confederacy. 26% uh, poverty, so one in four people in the city of Richmond live beneath the poverty line. When we, did, when we disaggregate that data, it looks like something like 43% of the black people in the city of Richmond are, are beneath the poverty line. Uh, and the city is about 50% African American and, you know, give or take 50% white. I mean, there's some smaller categories for Latinx and Asian communities, but it's roughly black and white. Right? Um, the poverty of the city of Richmond is concentrated in both the East End of the city and the south side of the city. So uh, there's only four sides of town, just like many towns. There's a north side, there's an east end, there's a west end, and south side. So most of the poverty is like half country and half of the city. Um, and there's reasons for that, right? We talk about historical trauma in this work. Uh, because I only got uh, less than an hour, uh, we're not gonna go all the way back to slavery, but we will say that Richmond was a major slave port Right, and after the end of the transcontinental slave trade, during the intracontinental slave trade, Richmond was the top place for the breeding of people of African ancestry and their selling and their sell down south and out west. So that's all I'm going to say about that because you know that would pretty much be the whole talk if we talked about just the, the slave trade in Richmond, Virginia. But because I like to bring things to contemporary realities, it was going to start in 1950, right? It was going to start with the Fair Housing Act and the New Deal, and we'll talk about redlining, right? So for those that may not want to go back the full 400 years, we're just going to go back to my grandma's time and talk about what happened there. Uh, so due to uh, redlining, uh, which was the act of uh, the Homeowners Loan Corporation assessing the value of neighborhoods in the city of Richmond. It happened everywhere, just to, you know, happened in D.C. Every city you can find concentrations of African people. When the Homeowners Loan Corporation went through that neighborhood, they took a red marker and, read and, and uh, colored in where those black neighborhoods were. And that red meant that that neighborhood was ineligible for refinancing of mortgages and could not get, and folks could not, that lived in those areas could not get loans to purchase their home or to purchase a new home, okay? So this phenomenon of redlining uh, was exclusively race-based. White people did not face that same discrimination. They did face a slight form of discrimination. If you live close to a black community, your neighborhood was graded like a C instead of an F because the blacks might cross over 
and to your neighborhood. Uh, and Richmond in the east end and the south side, uh, I'll get to a map later. You'll see how the entire areas of that are, are all red. And we'll talk about how that impacts today. But at Lewis Ginter Botanical Garden, as it expanded beyond its walls, you know, I got hired in 2016 to try to do two things. A, to steward a collaborative, and this is a key point for those that are taking notes. As we do this work, it's been super important as a predominantly white organization to not step into this work alone, right? The space of collaboration has not only made it easier for this botanical garden to show up in this work, but it also has rooted the work in other spaces. So it's kind of like you plant a tree, right? So when you plant a tree, you know, you've got your, what, your one foot wide uh, hole, right? But when you plant a tree, you hope that the roots expand beyond that one foot. So as it expands, it's more stable, right? And it goes deep and, and wide. Same thing with the collaborations, right? So if Lewis Ginter stood in that space by itself, it'd be easy to push this effort over. But as soon as I got there, we already had a collaborative called Beautiful RVA. It's basically a collaboration for collective impact of all these different greening organizations in the city. Not just nonprofits, it's also for-profit organizations, individuals, foundations, city departments, as well as county uh, 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 leadership and departments as well. They all have decided to be a part of this uh, multi-sector interdisciplinary collaborative. So you have people from the Office of Sustainability in the room with the people from the Department of Public Works and with the foundation and with activist community in the room with a uh, nonprofit that does uh, green infrastructure. So it's all different types of folks um, in the space. And Lewis Ginter entered in the space as the, the background organization for the collaborative. So when you do collaboratives and things like that, it sounds great when you're like, oh, everybody's collaborating, but who's managing the collaboration, right? Who's sending the emails? Who's scheduling the meetings? Who's ordering the food? Who's keeping the notes? You know what I mean? Who's stewarding the collaborative? And a lot of times, organizations that are in that space don't have the staff, so the one that had the most capacity was Lewis Ginner. But Lewis Ginner was very wise, or, or I would say very mindful, to be like, hey, we don't want to own this, so we're not going to put our name on it. We're going to put and create a whole nother brand for the collaborative. Right? So Beautiful RVA was born in that spirit. Hired a whole uh, advertising firm, marketing firm, came up with a logo, you know, created a website, all these branded materials. I think I have some stickers with me. Uh, and the idea is that people would not think or would not confuse and think that this was Lewis Ginter's thing. This is really not. But when I got hired, I was like, well, you're in charge of stewarding the collaborative, which is amazing. Uh, the second part of this work that I uh, do is uh, the Get to Urban Gardener program. And uh, this effort is really the spear of the garden's community engagement strategy. The Get to Urban Gardener program was thought up of in that collaborative space of these folks meeting. Uh, mind you, there was a, the, when they first started meeting, it was catalyzed by the garden holding some sort of a talk, like a lecture. Somebody came and they brought all those people together and they said, we're going to keep meeting. So that's another jewel. So if you could find like some luminary, some person of repute that can talk to these issues of equity or what have you, get them to come to your city have them to attract all the different organizations, and then once you got that core body of people in the room, then you're like, all right, we're gonna keep meeting, right? And get everybody on the same page, and then you just quarterly roll something out to keep the conversation going. And in that continuing of the conversation, uh, one thought that came to mind was uh, this phenomenon. How many of y'all ever see corporate group go out into a neighborhood and start a garden and everybody's all happy. They got this. They got their shovels, and the ceilings are planted perfectly, and the soil is just like even in the raised bed. But then six months later, it's weeded over. Mm -hmm. How many have ever seen that phenomenon? Damn, 
I mean, every time I ask that question, everybody has seen that phenomenon. So, no, we got work to do. <laughs> uh, so, in that room, folks were like, okay, so how do, we, how do we deal with this? How do we address the fact that communities are being, in, are, are being uh, in some ways, paternalized, where corporate groups or whomever are coming in and dropping this amazing green infrastructure off with no instructions? for the community that's indigenous there, or no buy-in, or no ownership from those organizations, for those community residents. What is it that we need to do before that corporate group comes to ensure that people in the community have the skills and the resources necessary to have ownership of those spaces? So uh, we came up with, uh, was, was the idea was that we need to do some sort of community training. And um, the Ginter Urban Gardener Program was uh, born. Uh, it's a 12-week training teaching sustainable horticulture and agriculture. Because I am a botanical garden, so I've got to throw the horticulture in there, right? <laughs> uh, so it's got to be some ornamental and aesthetic stuff. Uh, urban garden design, right? As well as project management and volunteer coordination. These are all skills that are necessary for the stewardship of a green space, right? You gotta know how to at least design it or enhance it as it, it grows, and you gotta know how to lead a project. What's the budget, right? How do you get the volunteers, and when the volunteers get there, who knows how to break them up into groups of three in order to make sure that everything that needs to get done for the day gets done. That's not something that you just walk up on the space and like know how to do. It's something that somebody has to actually like teach you how to do. But most importantly, the thread that runs through all these themes is this idea called community trust building, which is uh, a concept that uh, I gleaned from an organization called Initiatives of Change, where we, it's really about personal development, but it's a way of engaging conversations about race and class that creates safe spaces for individuals across difference, right? And so, for example, I did, that sounded really wordy. But so, um, in real time, the first workshop of the training program is an explicit discussion about race and concentrated poverty. Before we pick up a shovel, before we talk about ceiling, before the board biology is even uttered, it's this redlining stuff, what was the history, what's the stats in terms of Richmond today? What is inclusion, right? What does it mean to be inclusive, right? What is, uh, how do you listen to folks that don't have your same lived experience? Yeah, I mean, some of us take for granted that we actually know how to listen, but many of us don't. We know how to respond to someone talking and they're giving their ideas, but actually listening. Um, and then third or uh, fourth is, uh, how to develop a team so that you can steward this change over time, right? So all that personal development stuff is bundled up into the work. And so instead of it just being a technical program where we're here to teach you these skills, it's also about the personal transformation, the individual transformation. As you know, Michael Jackson says, I'm starting with the man in the mirror. It's required, the, the work that requires, that is required of individuals to do inwardly before they can begin to engage anything externally, right? Um, and then on top of that, we do every Saturday, there's some sort of service learning activity. So everything from edible landscaping, rainwater harvesting, stormwater management, how to build raised beds, uh, how to work a BCS tiller, uh, everything that you can imagine in terms of urban agriculture and urban greening, plant propagation, working in a greenhouse, all types of stuff. So we really try to place emphasis on this classroom time and uh, hands-on stuff. And the meat of this is that uh, this is done through the frame of actually delivering some sort of green space into the community as a result of the training. So every cohort is hyper-locally targeted into a specific neighborhood in the city, right? And then we recruit from that neighborhood and from the city at large. And then when we decide who gets into the class, we're making that decision based off of how many people of color, how many, how many white folks, how many people 
uh, non-binary gender identity, you know, who makes over 50,000 a year, who makes less than 20,000 a year, who's a, who's a high school dropout, who's a graduate or college, who, what your occupation is. We're looking at all of these different demographic pieces to make sure that the class is as different as possible, right? So when you come into the class, you're probably gonna be in a room with somebody that you probably wouldn't have been in a room with otherwise, unless you were like at DMV. But on your night, not that type of close proximity. Uh, and we really emphasize like the, the, the work of really having hard dialogue. So the type of spaces that we develop are all centered around the community's history and the community's narrative. So every uh, cohort does a community conversation that they are trained for. So the trainees are trained to lead a community conversation and then they actually lead a community conversation from residents of the neighborhood to identify what type of green space they want to see happen, right? Uh, using their input. This is uh, uh, Six Mile Zion Baptist Church Community Garden. This is the first project that we did. Uh, Six Mile Zion is important in the conversation about redlining and a conversation about urban renewal because Six Mile Zion sits on the border. Well, I don't even know. It's not a border. It's like it's the church and then the highway. So I-95 bisected black communities across the country, right? Or the interstate highway system in Richmond is I-95. And also it's I-64, so east, west, and north and south. These highways went through black communities. So Six Mile Zion Baptist, I can stand on the porch of it and spit on a highway. That's how close it was from being torn down. But the community rallied to protect one of the oldest black churches in the city. The actual garden sits on land that was, uh, through eminent domain, took homes away from African American community members. The highway itself displaced over 3,000 homeowners in the city. So when we were digging, you know, planting trees on this property, we're actually putting pickaxe into house foundation, right? So the metaphor of like planting in the hard places is resonant because, you know, as we dig it through, I found, somebody found an old holster from a, from a revolver in the garden. Like, yo, somebody, people lived here. There was activity, human activity. But the garden is a commemoration of that trauma, right? So as you go and plant or you're in that space, it's a space of remembrance. And, you know, you always hear the wailing of the highway to remind you what happened. Uh, we'll go through a couple of examples of the spaces that we've done. I don't know how many are in here. This is, I didn't do this last time, but I hope i um, make this quick. This is McDonough Community Garden. This is not the most recent picture, uh, but this is like 30 raised beds. There's now a pergola here and a, 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 a permeable path that winds through the middle of the garden. Um, did a project with Sabra, uh, you know, the hummus. Israeli I man, I don't, we're not going to have a conversation. About <laughs> <laughs> they were paying, and you know, folks needed some money, so we hired people from the community to build the garden. So, uh, I will say this: they said that they wanted the garden to be for their employees who did not have access to healthy food, which was fascinating because if you're working at a company, you should be thinking about how they get paid. But anyway, really, that there is a really nice garden. <laughs> Oh, uh, really bad there. And we can probably get into that in the question. Uh, let me see. Uh, okay, hold on. There's an emphasis on doing with the community instead of doing for it. That's an important gem point to note. There's a paradigm shift. This work that we do is not really about charity. This is about, well, it's not about charity at all. It's about how do we build community agency and capacity? How do we move? communities from a space of waiting for somebody to do something for them to being able to do for themselves, right? So how do we empower you with the technical assistance and the resources so that you can shift your reality on your own? Uh, really super high emphasis on not owning any projects in community, right? So, you know, branding tells us that as a nonprofit, the more projects that we got, the better we are seen by philanthropy. But we're always on the front to philanthropy, like none of these projects are ours. We're working with people in places to support them in their work. And if you fund us, 
to do this work, all we're doing is transferring the funding to these community funds, which is also uh, a part of the racial equity piece and the garden using its privilege to, to dis disrupt uh, inequity, right? Since folks only in you know, nonprofit sectors, they like to have a conversation about who has capacity and who has the board developed and all that stuff. Well, Louis Ginner is 37 years old. He has a $7 million budget. Doesn't really need your grant, but hey, we'll take your money and make it do some amazing things. And you know, corporate folks like to put their stamp on stuff. So that's a whole nother topic. So more spaces. Uh, Harding Street, I, you know, I just do that. That's a close one. Uh, Harding Street, Urban Ag Center, this is a, uh, before I worked at Lewis Ginter, this was uh, an indoor farm that we built in Petersburg, Virginia through National Institute of Food and Agriculture funding, AFRI. You've heard of USDA and their research grants, right? Okay, so uh, in 2014, Virginia State University School of Agriculture got $3 million to develop a sustainable urban food system in Petersburg, Virginia, and I was the inaugural director. The YMCA was a former USO. It's one of those spaces that was on the Chitlin circuit. So John, uh, James Brown and uh, Reza Franklin and Chuck Berry and you know the greats went through and played and performed here. But it had been closed for you know a couple of years, and so Virginia State got it and said, okay, we'll turn it into an indoor farm. So what you see here are vertical towers, aquaponics, flood and drain systems. Uh, hydroponic spaces, aeroponics, um, LED lighting, and as well as uh, 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 high-pressure sodium uh, uh, light bulbs, like very hot lights. And then uh, on the roof of the building, we put solar on the entire roof of the building to power all of, all of the uh, indoor ag stuff. And in the back, we put a commercial kitchen, refrigeration, like 30 by 30 cooler. Um, so that this would really be like a sustainable system. Outside, micro farms, uh, so like a whole vacant lot, just raised beds and you know, rainwater harvesting. Orchards with trees, like I think we planted like 40 some fruit trees. Yeah, and then like a vineyard, like great, great vines. All in proximity to the space in the heart of Petersburg, Virginia. Uh, literally just like, you know, Increasing access to healthy food, but in a different way. Like here we're going to train people and teach people how to use these alternative systems of growing, but also like culinary arts and value added products and all that type of stuff. So like really like how to create micro food systems within a block by block network. Um, Swansboro Community Garden, one site that we started. So with Edible Garden, there's a high school I went to. We put that, put a garden in there. Uh, Fifth District Mini Farm. This is actually black owned land in Richmond, Virginia, on the south side of Richmond, where we've been supporting uh, one of our trainees who came through our program, wanted to start uh, a farm on this back lot. His grandfather used to grow here, and he heard about our program, went through it, and as a result, um, this is probably about a quarter acre of land, but there's a whole other lot that is owned by a librarian brother, um, so it's like this collaboration for, from, uh, you know, enslaved, formerly, uh, uh, descended of formerly enslaved African Americans, and now like continental Africans collaborating on land use that's specifically for, you know, self-determination for people of color. So powerful, powerful, powerful work. We, we do a festival called Highly National Day there. Um, uh, can you give me some water? Uh, about to, um, so look, so uh, this is the point where I can jump into, uh, I got 15 more minutes. I got 15 more minutes. Okay, all right, so we're going to we're gonna fast forward. Uh, six steps to fostering racial equity or, do, or, or doing this work through a racial equity lens, okay? I got 25. Yes, right, we're doing good. Um, so step one. For your collaborative or for your group of, ent of entities or collaborating partnership organizations that are going to do this work, the first thing you need to do is establish an understanding of what is racial equity. Everybody got to be on the same page about that. 
if you can't get on the same page about that, it's a wrap. It's not, you're not going to go for it, right? So in this case, I, you know, I'll show this example visually to delineate the difference between and from people of African ancestry um, that actually centered white folks in getting land. We think about things like the Homestead Act. Uh, we think about uh, the Civil War and the promise of 40 acres and a mule and Andrew Johnson literally turning his back on all the formerly enslaved African people are saying, yo, we're going to give the land back to the folks that seceded from you know, the United States. And not only that, you know, I had a nerve to say that the blacks need to work hard to earn some land. Like, what? This is, how, how, have we not worked for free? For, <laughs> like, I don't know. Anyway, uh, there's a whole great book about this called White Rage and then also uh, Slavery by Another Name. So understanding racial equity is the first step. You know, are we using the same de definitions? What is racial justice? Well, in this case, instead of everybody having to reach for uh, the uh, fruit, what if we expelled you the trees and gave deference to the people that had not had apples for, all, for, 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 however, for however long? Like, you go first. Since you haven't had apples in 400 years, the folks that have been having apples for 400 years, y'all go to the back of the line. The folks that haven't had it, now they can access it. They don't need no box. They can get it for themselves and move forward, all right? Justice is the hardest one to get to. The equity work is just like the step towards that, but it is not justice, right? Doing equity work is just like, how do we create a culture where people can understand that justice is necessary, okay? I'm gonna make sure I make that delineation. <coughs> um, this is McDonough Community Garden. Um, I think we planted like 30 fruit trees here uh, at a community garden uh, since 2012. Crazy. Uh, this is another site. Uh, this is uh, Gilpin Court, which is a public housing community in Richmond, which is the oldest public housing in the city of Richmond. Uh, it used to be all Jackson Ward, but then they ran the highway through, and so on one side became Gilpin Court, and the other side Jackson Ward. But uh, this is a community farm that's now underway as a result of the uh, work that we've been doing. Also, in step one, um, it's important to like understand that there's a lot of intermingling, synergistic, compounding things that are, it's like a knot. You gotta untie the knot. Like, Black people or communities of color dealing with internalized racism and class isms, you know, are also uh, interacting with institutional racism and interpersonal racism. You know, white folks are dealing with their own bias and privilege, and then their own uh, fears of being ostracized from other white folks as a result of them being anti-racist. Uh, you know, all of this stuff is happening simultaneously. And so, you know, it's important to ha have spaces where affinity groups can do work, but then there's also spaces where those groups can intermingle and discuss <clears throat> what the hell is happening, you know, as they do this work. It's, it's, it's hard, it's not for the faint of heart, you know, it requires soul searching for folks. And this is, you know, it, it's, it's, it's real. Yeah. Uh, the second step, is engaging and empowering affected populations and stakeholders. So I put this as an equation. Engaging is like, okay, hey, come take my survey, right? Hey, I want to hear what you think, right? Uh, let me do a focus group with you, right? Uh, I'll have a community conversation, and I get all these results. I put it all in the white paper. And then the people that were at the actual session never see the white paper again or never hear back from the folks that surveyed them, right? So that's engaging. Right? That's community engagement. But community empowerment is like, okay, we did all this research, we surveyed you, we asked you questions. Now, based on the responses, here are the resources that you need, or uh, here are the things that you said you needed in order to create the reality that you want to create. Right? And so this work for us is a combination of both. Engaging that community and at the same time providing resources in order for that community to iterate you know, its own solution. So we asked the, ask the community, what kind of green space do you want? What do you want it to do? What do you want it to look like? 
they tell us, hey, we want a space for gathering. We want food. We want, you know, beautification. We want something that's going to, you know, address the stormwater and the urban heat island effect. And we're like, okay, all right. So we got trees. We got wood. We got soil. We got plant material. We got shovels. Uh, we're going to need to get all that to you. And we will get all that to you, right? And we will also provide you support and, man and, and, and promoting these work days and, do you need website help? Do you need marketing assistance? You know, what is it that, what else do you need? Think hard. Don't just, you know, give me the first thing that comes up. Really think about the resiliency of the space and how can we support you in making, this, making sure it's sustainable. So, uh, yeah, we make sure that the community, at the end of the day, that my work every day is about how do I make sure that the community has taken ownership and leadership. Like, my success story is that this community garden or urban farm is now more resilient and doesn't need anybody to grant a grant for them or doesn't need me to give them any more tools, they're good, right? They're, they're, they're set up and they're on the road. Uh, step three, it's important to gather and analyze the data that has been dis disaggregated. It's not just data for data sake. It's how do we break that data down along racial lines, around income lines, how do we break that data down across social indicators so that folks can see what exactly is going on in the community. This allows us to quantify when we're moving the needle and where we need to put the needle in the first place. So in Richmond, Virginia, this map is of the, uh, this is the ERS, USDA, lack of food access map, because we don't say food deficit. Uh, this is the green, is the area that don't have access to healthy food. Okay. Uh, as we move past getting the data that's been disaggregated, we've got to start asking questions. So step four is conducting systems analysis of the root causes of the inequity. All right? So nonprofits are very good at putting band-aids on bullet wounds. Mm -hmm. Right? So how do we go into community and be like, yo, Son, he needs, uh, not only does he need stitches, but we need to figure out how to stop the gun violence that's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's at the root of it? Why are these inequities in existence, right? So, you know, some questions you can ask. What's, what institutions are involved? What unfair policies or practices have been in place that created the inequity? Um, one of the questions that I like to ask is, uh, uh, what norms, what myths or popular ideas justify or maintain the problem? So you, we, we're the food company. So everybody likes to say, oh, well, the blacks, they just don't like to eat it. When, you know, the grocery store doesn't work in the neighborhood, it's because that they don't, they, you know, they like soul food and chitlins and stuff. Yeah, that's crazy, right? <laughs> Black people like to eat healthy, too. Maybe it's because it's too expensive, right? Or maybe it's a transit issue, right? Or maybe it's uh, not the culturally relevant food for that community, right? There's so many other factors. But the first one that the myth goes to is that, oh, the grocery store is here, the black people not going there, that must mean that they don't like to eat healthy. You want to have a question? No, I do not. What was the job? The jobs? Is the jobs that black people had. Like, the right. job to a job in this country, and I still never heard nothing back. There you go. And I know somebody that applied one time, and we got the same background there, some back the same day. Right, so, you know, thank you for that. So it's all these different things that are happening at the same time. So, doing that systems analysis, trying to figure out the root cause makes your work radical, and sometimes philanthropy don't really like that. And I'm sorry to say, that's the work that we have to be engaging philanthropy on, to say, hey, we're tired of putting a Band-Aid on the bullet wound, we want to get to the root causes. So engaging philanthropy in that conversation means that you got to be brave enough to open up your mouth when they're putting their grant application in front of you, and you be like, hey, man, this is great. I like where you're going, but can we get to some deeper things? We need more money to really tackle what's really going on in this community, right? It's not just about this garden that we're starting. This is great. This is a start, but, you know, this is deeper than a raised bed. Um, Conducting the systems analysis goes back to the conversations I have about redlining. 
So this is the HOLC map for Richmond, Virginia, right? So HOLC, Homeowners Loan Corporation, they went across the country and they assessed the community, gave it the grade. So these are the red lines that are indicated when we say redlining. And as you can see, this is the east end of Richmond, and then, you know, because the map, it's not, you, you can Google it. This is the rest of the map for the south side shows that the predominant spaces. But these red dots, though, are important, because <coughs> these red dots reflect the concentrations of vacant and blighted properties in the city of Richmond. <laughs> so look at where they're concentrated. In the same areas that were formerly redlined. Right? So when we begin to look at the root causes of the inequity, after we have disaggregated the data, we can see that there are multiple things happening at the same time in these in, uh, communities of color uh, that are uh, compounding issues. Right? Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Where is Churchill located? This is Churchill. Okay. This part of <clears throat> so step five, um, it's important to identify strategies and target resources to address those root causes. And when you're developing those solutions, because this is where you start think tanking, what can I do? If the community that's most affected is not at the, at the table, you need to start over. Okay? This is not a space for you to start brainstorming and thinking about solutions and the people that are most impacted by these issues are not in a room. In fact, if they are not in a room, you're doing the whole thing wrong, right? As you've got all that data and talked about racial equity and you still ain't got the black folks that are, are, the, are the Latinx community in the room, oh, you missed the point. <laughs> this is not about you. This is about centering non-white communities. So uh, some of the great questions that I love to ask, uh, what groups uh, most adversely affected by the current problem, do you want to benefit? Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, it's another question I like to ask. So who, who, uh, who benefits from there even being a problem? Mm -hmm. This is often a tough question. Mm -hmm. This is like, okay, damn, I got to now, I got to act, I got to go and deal with the hospital system, right? And I got to deal with the government, the municipal government might actually be creating this problem. That means I gotta do some policy changes and then we gotta have some power struggles. It's real, like who's in charge? Um, but the key words in any equitable strategy are working with and community ownership. And it's prefaced by your authenticity. Everything about this revolves around authenticity. And I would be brave enough to say your vulnerability because you're gonna get a lot of this wrong, right? It's gonna be mess ups along the way. And being vulnerable enough to say, yo, we were wrong. Like, uh, Rise of Rise, y'all were in here a few minutes ago? Mm -hmm. They were like, yeah, you know, we recognize that we, uh, it was we, the two white women who founded this effort, were like, yo, we need to stop. We're not supposed to be doing this. Maybe there's somebody else that needs to be in this space. So that form of vulnerability radical vulnerability, I even would say, is imperative because it's like white supremacy lives in this space of, I am never wrong, I am the white. Everything, everybody else, even if I'm wrong, I will find a way to make it seem like it's somebody else's fault, right? And creating that type of vulnerability is a space where you can really be human, but that's not what the system is. Anyway, uh, part of the step five of, of, of uh, using the right strategies is also reading and studying. Um, so, I mean, this is a, I did this is an old slide. There's more books. There's better books to read than these, but these are good ones to start. Uh, right fragility uh, is about confronting your own defense mechanisms that occur when folks bring up racism, right? And then even more so when you're challenged to be anti-racist like to really think about what does it mean to embody that and to not be afraid of that. That's super important. And then the revolution will not be funded beyond a nonprofit industrial complex. You know, boy, we live in this world where it is literally a system where people were, well, first of all, we have to acknowledge that nonprofits exist to transfer wealth 
between the wealthy and other wealthy people. Like, we like to think that nonprofits are about social justice, but I was in a room with the retreat from a lady from a foundation, and she was talking to this nonprofit. I was on a, I'm on the board for the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust, which is a land trust in the city of Richmond. So the lady is a foundation head leading this retreat. And she said, hmm, it seems like you're leaning towards racial justice. I was like, what? I thought that was the point. <laughs> so, so nonprofits, no, it's not necessarily about that. This is like transfer of wealth and usually like transfer of white money to other white money, white led nonprofits. Not only transferring money, but land and other capital resources. Uh, so will it be funded? On the days that I've gotten a new grant and it's big money, I'm like, yes. Flash, if you will, solve the problem. <laughs> well, on the days I get denied, I'm like, Flash, <laughs> they don't understand. They're racist. And <laughs> anyway, um, another book, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paula Friere, is a really amazing book that helped me shift, helped me shift, and help, has helped millions of others shift how they engage communities and the the paradigm in which they engage those communities. Uh, the idea of the uh, liberation of those who are oppressed having to, be there, having, to be, having to be exemplified by other oppressed people is one of the most important term, uh, ideas in the pedagogy of the oppressed. But there's another idea in there that talks about the oppressor being locked in chains her, or herself as a result of the oppressing that is being done, that that actually creates a prison for the oppressor who can't be human, and because he is or her are actively in the act of dehumanizing someone else, right? And I think that's such a resonant idea. Is like how do the systems, institutional systems, prop up people of non-white ancestry and make the suffering of of non-white people like there's, there's a gap between the understanding of what's happening. So as a result, that as a result of that gap. It's like you can't even really empathize, right, of what's going on because of the disparity. But um, those are three books just to get you started. Um, uh, there's way more. Uh, like I said, uh, White Rage is a really good book. I just, I just started reading that. And then um, there's uh, this book called The History of White Trash. There's another book, The History of White People. Um, these, those books really help break down what whiteness is. And we really have to start inspecting that. Like I think like it's only been in the last what, five, 10 years that we really start to examine what is whiteness and how have we interpreted whiteness and the othering of everybody else. Like there's whiteness and then everybody else. Like how do we, we need to start deconstructing. Uh, step six is to, uh, and so this is, the, this is the fun part, is where you just, you know, you, you come up with an idea you put it into place, track the results, you look at your progress, and then you revise your strategy. Because really, all of this work is iterative in its nature. And when I say iterative, I say, you know, nobody has solved racism, right? Where? Is there somebody that solved the problems of racism in the built environment? Has they ever? If since there is no one that has done that, we're all trying to figure this shit out. We're like making it up as we go along, and we're learning from our mistakes and we're learning from others who have made mistakes and we're uh, progressing accordingly. When you said that, I assume a lot of young children and how young children that I've seen interact with other people and don't see that concept, right. don't know that concept, it's kind of interesting to think about like how as adults we, I don't know. We condition the yeah. children into these social, yeah. We can have a conversation after. I was my, when I was a kid. I I lived in Hanau, Germany. I lived in first. I lived when I was a small child. I lived in Washington uh, State, and then we moved. I lived in Seattle, and then we moved uh, to uh, Hanau, Germany. So all my adolescence was there, and I can tell you this is this is facts. I mean, I didn't know what race was in my young in my up until like I'm 10, 12. I didn't really understand it. But then when I moved back to Richmond, Virginia. <laughs> And I'm like, holy, you know, this is where it's like, oh, there's only one white kid on the bus, you know, they picking on him, and then on the, on, the, on the flip side, like, my neighborhood look like my neighborhood, but, you know, other parts of the city look amazing, and it's, you know, racial stuff, and as I got older, you know, understand that. So yes, the conditioning is a, is, a, is a part of it. But there's also 
structural inequities that these kids are growing up into. So how this is all, really the point of all this is how do we create equity across communities so everybody has access to the amazingness of life, right? Um, and they don't have to come up and feel inferior because of where they live or have a chip on their shoulder or be broken by the system as a result of the color of their skin. Um, so uh, I don't know how much time I got left, but um, uh, I, the, a lot, another name for the work that I've been intoning this is uh, giving props to Emmanuel Pratt from out of Sweetwater in uh, Chicago. Really calling this regenerative placemaking, right? Because really all we're doing is we're taking plants and putting them into the built environment and transforming the built environment so that it's more biophilic or has more green infrastructure. Uh, and that, but that social justice sits at the heart of this. And that essentially our work is not just food access. It's also environmental justice. It's also climate resiliency. It's also community organizing. It's also stormwater management. It's also urban heat island effect. It's like all these things at the same time. And depending on the funder, we might highlight one or the other. <laughs> but, uh, but essentially, it's like the practice of being multidimensional, right? We're, we're acting, you know, we're time traveling, you know, we're bringing the past to the present, and at the same time, like, we're engaging in multi-levels of our uh, liberty. Uh, simultaneously. How many time, how much time I have? Eight minutes. Eight minutes? Uh, I'm not going to do this. So yeah, you know, there's a whole process to regenerative placemaking and the work that we do follows that. But I'll start here, I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, part of this work is also giving acknowledgement to our indigenous ancestry. Um, you know, permaculture is uh, a hot topic for regenerative farming now, uh, but it's important to recognize that indigenous farm, indigenous agriculture is a thing that indigenous communities were not just like tribes sparsed out around North America, that these were cities, civilizations, and nations with intensive crop production techniques uh, that people now call permaculture, but uh, <laughs> You know, uh, David Holmberg and uh, Toby McGuire, uh, no, Toby, Toby Hemingway. Uh, <laughs> Toby Hemingway. They, they, they got their ideas from sifting through indigenous land use strategies, right? And, you know, Bill Mollison and all of them, uh, they observed indigenous Australians. And, you know, what if we gave them credit? This is my conversation. And so looking at this work, of transforming the built environment through a lens of permaculture is very, I think, uh, advanced level stuff, but it does provide us some sort of a framework in how we can be more equitable, not only with the people that we engage in on a social level, but also, which is ironic, because I, I hardly ever run into black permaculturalists, but I see a lot of white ones, which is bizarre, because the conversation about permaculture has a social component. But I don't know, that's another lecture, too. <laughs> we'll just leave that there. <laughs> I mean, all these ideas sound amazing, but I just never really see uh, the permaculture that's really practicing on the social level, right? So if we can lift that conversation up uh, for communities of color to embody these things, uh, it would be amazing. And then I'll leave it with a quote from George Washington Carver, the father of regenerative agriculture, decades before Rodale, planting uh, nuts and uh, beans for nitrogen fixers and composting and so much fascinating stuff that I probably could do. There, there's a brother in the uh, vending space now that has a whole thing dedicated to Carter, uh, to, to George Washington Carver. Start where you are with what you have, make something of it, and never be satisfied. That's just, I mean, um, we'll start there, stop there, and go into questions. Uh, yo, thank you for being here. You had a lot of really excellent slides that I took pictures of. Thank Very you. informative. I wanted to offer another book recommendation. Go for it. Um, I had a chance to see Cornell Westby a few years ago and meet him. 
and he talked about how Moby Dick is a book about white supremacy, and I was like, <laughs> so I read it through that lens and realized he's right, the whole book is symbolism, mm -hmm. so it's probably the first book ever written about white identity and white supremacy before we had those terms, mm -hmm. so check it out, written in 1850 by Herman Melville, Moby Dick is a book about white supremacy. Thank you, thanks for sharing. No problem. Right Seeing that um, Trump is in office, he'll probably get in office again. The Democrats look real weak. And that systemic racism has been part of this society for like 450 years, and even going back 2,000 years. We start looking at Europe's march into this mess that we're in now. Do you really think that, um, I mean, we're doing great work. I just came in at the end. I actually got a permaculture design certificate. And, you know, all the, you know, I'm a horticulturist mm -hmm. and a tree expert here in Maryland. Mm -hmm. But I'm just really thinking, you know, we're kind of preaching to the choir here. Mm -hmm. The average white person, every time a black person says, it, you're pulling the black card, you know, they're saying, now, why are you bringing up that? That was a long time ago. But well, we still suffer from uh, the repercussions and the ramifications of being a slave. Mm -hmm. When me and you get pulled over by the police, you know how it is. Yes, sir. When the white person gets pulled over, unless you're in Kentucky, and you look like a meth head, you get treated differently. Right. So my, my question is, in your experience, and yeah, I, I just came in when you were talking about Germany, because I've been to Germany, and I found it very racist. Yeah, right, and I'm talking about it when I was like, okay, okay. no, yeah, okay. Well, maybe you weren't since that. Do you really feel like it's even viable, other than just putting a Band-Aid on it, and it, it, as black people, and respecting the, the the, the red indigenous people here, right? So we can make this distinction, even though we know our ancient ancestors came here too, right, right, right. before Columbus, mm -hmm. that we should just start looking at Africa. Because yeah. Europe is looking at Africa, yeah. and so are so so the they, Indians so, and Chinese. So, so, so. so why, why stay somewhere that we're not even welcomed? Because this, this is one of the white homelands, like Australia, like uh, um, uh, New Zealand, the US and Canada, and it's probably another country in there. South Africa. So I'm just thinking in your experience as a black man, yeah. why, why, why even really try to, I mean we should do something, but maybe we should be funneling our resources like the Jews do to Israel, because they see that as their home. So anyway, go right here. That's a very, that's a very complicated, well I'll say this, it's, it's definitely uh, important for people of color, for African people, to be thinking about how they can go back to Africa and engage in a working with instead of a doing for mentality on the continent, right? Because a lot of us go back to Africa as tourists and we engage kind of like we're white folks in, in Africa. And so there's a whole conversation about that that uh, needs, to be, <laughs> needs to be dealt with. Um, so yes, we should be going back to Africa and developing and working in the same ways that we are trying to develop communities here and should be doing it across the pond. Um, I feel like the, I can't answer all your questions, but I can say that I feel like racism is white people's problem. I feel like it's white people's problem being imposed upon black and brown people, and that it, in order for it to stop, that it requires white folks to be brave enough to challenge other white people about their, uh, about the policies that exist and the past history. Most white folks don't have a clue about American history. Uh, reality is, if I went to the same school as you, chances are I didn't cover any of what, you know, I had to learn in my adult years about the Civil War, Andrew Johnson, you know, redlining, uh, Jim Crow, sharecropping, all that stuff. I had to learn it on my own. So if I had to learn it on my own, I know you had to learn it on your own because we went to, basically, we read from the same textbooks, unless you went to like an ultra private school or something like that, that maybe you got some other type of curriculum. I don't know, I, I can't say that. But I will say that uh, learning this information, learning this history, and then challenging other white folks is the role and responsibility of white folks. It's your job to be anti-racist. It's my job, to be, it's, 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 it's communities of color's job to develop their communities, but at the same time, white folks got a job too. And it's, 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 it's I, I can't put all the burden in the shoulder 400 years of oppression as a black person. It's like, yo, I didn't do this. I was born into this, and I'm born into this hierarchy. I need those who were born into the hierarchy on another level to challenge it and upend it with me, right? Uh, 
I wanted to say like, I don't have a question. I wanted to say like, how I look at racism and stuff. I look at it like, I'm, everybody is racist to everybody. Everybody be racist to everybody. Everybody treat everybody wrong in some type of way. And like, it shouldn't be like that. And I feel as though we shouldn't pay attention to what happened in the past, but to what's happening in the present because we're here now. And what we can do is to be together. Yeah.